Welcome to today's panel discussion on Kita Kyushu's efforts leading a transition toward a sustainable Asia by a PPP model. How much do you know about the city of Kita Kyushu, where the Harassus Asia meeting is scheduled to be held in 2021? As an industrial city that supported Japan's rapid economic growth, Kita Kyushu suffered from pollution in the past. In later years, Kita Kyushu overcame its pollution problems in cooperation with industries, the local government, academia, and its residents, rebuilding itself as a leading environmental city in Japan and the world. What did this process involve? Kita Kyushu has also used its experience and know-how, namely the civic and administrative power that the city has cultivated throughout its transition from overcoming pollution to becoming an eco-model city, as well as its technological capabilities as an area with clusters of environmental industries to promote initiatives through public-private partnerships, offering solutions to Asian cities that are currently experiencing serious environmental problems as a result of rapid urbanization. In today's session, we will track the details of packages of support for solutions to environmental challenges in Asian cities that are being jointly promoted by companies and the local government in Kitakyushu. I would like to introduce today's panelists. Please give a nod or wave when I call your name. Facing the screen from the right, we have Mr. Hitoshi Arita, Vice Chairman of the Kitakyushu Overseas Water Business Association, Japan. Mr. Mitsukane Mori, General Manager of Nippon Steel Engineering, Japan. Mr. Tomoaki Ito, CEO and Representative Director of One World Corporation, Japan. Mr. Toshihiko Yanagi, Managing Director at NCT Malaysia, Malaysia. And Ms. Mayumi Oda, Executive Director at the Environment Bureau of the City of Kitakyushu, Japan. I am Shiko Hayashi from the Kitakyushu Urban Center of the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. Thank you for being here today. First, I would like to invite Ms. Oda from Kitakyushu City to talk to us about how the city is trying to solve the environmental issues that Asian cities are facing based on the experiences and know-how it has cultivated over its evolution from an industrial to environmental model city and how the government is working with companies in developing markets to deploy environmental technologies. Ms. Oda, please. My name is Mayumi Oda. I work at the Overseas Environmental Project Department in Kitakyushu City's Environment Bureau. I will be presenting on Kitakyushu's efforts leading a transition towards a sustainable Asia by a PPP model. These are the points that I would like to talk to you about today, ranging from an overview of the city to specific activities. The city of Kitakyushu is an environmentally advanced city and is actively engaged in various initiatives as an SDGs model city. I would like to start with a brief explanation about Kitakyushu City. First, Kitakyushu is located very close to China, South Korea, and other Southeast Asian countries. As a result, the city has regularly engaged in a variety of exchanges with other countries and cities in Asia. From the 1950s, Japan experienced a period of rapid economic growth and developed as one of four major industrial areas supporting this growth. This region is home to a number of companies, especially in the manufacturing industry, including Nippon Steel, which was founded in 1901. I would like to reflect a bit on our city's history to date. During the process of its development as an industrial city, Kitakyushu experienced a devastating level of pollution, which it overcame in partnership with industries, residents, and the local government. The photos in the center of the slide provide a comparison of the state of Dokai Bay in the city in the 1960s and today. Devoid of life, this bay was known as the Sea of Death, but has reclaimed its former glory thanks to the efforts of companies, the local government, and the city's residents. The graph to the right from a study by the World Bank shows how Kitakyushu has overcome past pollution in balance with the economy. Kitakyushu's commitment to the environment has been recognized not only within Japan, 
but also by UN agencies such as UNEP and OECD. Kirikyushu's environmental initiatives were sparked by a negative legacy in terms of its need to overcome pollution, but the city has since promoted advanced actions to create a recycling-oriented, sustainable and low-carbon society, and is currently taking up the challenge of becoming an SDG's model city by declaring its aim to become a zero-carbon city by 2050. Countless companies with a remarkable lineup of environmental technologies and products call Kirikyushu home. For example, Nippon Steel Engineering's waste-to-energy system is distinguished by its highly efficient power generation capacity and exhaust gas treatment technology. Aztec IDEA aims to achieve the creation of a circular economy with the recovery of gold, copper, rare metals, and other materials from waste electronics. In addition, Katie Kishu is working to become a center for resource recycling and to develop as a base with a concentration of next-generation energy facilities and overseas water businesses. Katie Kishu takes pride in its ability as an environmentally advanced city to provide solutions to future environmental problems. Katie Kishu's most distinctive feature is its ambition to find solutions to environmental problems in the Asian region using its technologies and know-how in cooperation with cities in China, Southeast Asia, and other locations overseas. Through these initiatives, Kirikishu has built relationships of trust and close networks with other cities in Asia. Kirikishu has carried out international cooperation activities with Asian cities for a number of years. In 2010, the city established the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society as a base for the sustainable implementation of low-carbon initiatives in Asia. The center aims to provide business solutions to environmental problems that cities and companies in Asia need by drawing on its experiences and know-how in overcoming pollution, networks of cities in Asia, and other resources. The activities conducted by the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society have their roots in intercity cooperation. Specifically, schemes are designed to create a foundation for cooperation between Kirikyushu and cities overseas based on the idea that cities can solve the problems they face and to encourage Japanese companies and their counterparts to promote businesses related to environmental improvement in order to develop comprehensive solutions to problems. For example, solutions to environmental problems such as waste treatment and water require a comprehensive approach that incorporates not only technology from the private sector, but also management know-how, public awareness, human resources development or institutional design. This is where the experiences of local governments can help. We believe that there are benefits for both parties when the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society, as a governmental entity, and companies that possess technologies work together on a project. For partner cities, comprehensive support from Kirikyushu, rather than the simple introduction of technology, can lead to the discovery of total solutions to problems. It will be possible for Japanese companies to implement projects more efficiently by having the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society play a role in training human resources and developing systems that may be difficult for companies to do themselves, and by serving as a bridge to partner cities. In addition, the center is able to obtain funding from the Japanese government and other sources, which means that cities overseas do not need to lay out funds at the initial stage of a project. I would like to present a specific example from Kirikyushu's sister city, Haiphong in Vietnam. Haiphong's green growth promotion plan supported by Kirikyushu includes 15 projects in seven areas, including waste management, energy, water supply, and sewage. Today, Kirikyushu and Haiphong are working together to implement these projects and develop commercial-based businesses. Since 2010, the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society has been implementing projects under this type of scheme with more than 20 projects currently underway. The projects shown here are only a small number of those that are being implemented. For example, in addition to Haiphong in Vietnam, projects have been carried out in Surabaya in Indonesia, the capital city of Phnom Penh in Cambodia, and Davao in the Philippines, in the areas of waste treatment and water supply. Lastly, I would like to introduce KMRV, the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society's initiative to quantify greenhouse gas emissions. The center is working on visualizing the extent to which implemented projects have reduced greenhouse gas emissions and is clarifying the degree of contribution of projects.
This concludes my presentation about the city of Kitikyushu. If you have a request for information about environmental technologies in Japan, or would like to find out about solutions to environmental issues, please feel free to contact us at the address on the screen. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Ms. Oda. Next, I would like for the representatives of the companies and organizations here today to introduce their initiatives to solve the environmental challenges being faced by Asian cities. First, we will hear from Mr. Hitoshi Arita, Vice Chairman of the Kira Kyushu Overseas Water Business Association in Japan, who will be talking about the water sector. I will be talking about water pollution issues today. The problem facing countries in Southeast Asia is that rapid economic development has led to an explosive growth and concentration in populations, which has resulted in the rapid deterioration of the urban environment. I would like to talk about water supply and sewerage separately. In the water supply sector, there are a number of waterworks facilities that have become vulnerable as they age. The advancing age of these facilities and decreasing quality of water sources have resulted in the emergence of various problems, such as insufficient supply capacity and deteriorating quality of tap water. In the sewerage sector, the original focus was on natural purification of lagoons and other areas. However, concentrated populations and insufficient treatment capacity have led to the rapid deterioration of river water quality, odors, and flooding. This has resulted in the deterioration of the living environment and the emergence of health hazards. I would like to briefly introduce some of the activities of COBA, the Kirikishu Overseas Water Business Association. Kirikishu City has had considerable experience in overcoming pollution in the 1960s and more than a century of experience in water and sewage operations. Kirikishu also has strong networks with partners overseas including agreements with sister cities. COBA was established 10 years ago. Today, 150 companies are members of our association, and we are expanding into markets overseas with the help of companies in a wide range of fields, including planning, manufacturing, and construction. We are also taking advantage of our past achievements and relationships, primarily with the national government, relevant organizations, and JICA, to formulate proposals for ODA and various other projects. In recent years, countries in Southeast Asia have faced serious problems, such as a shortage of technical experts and funding. This is an example of a project in Haiphong in Vietnam, carried out by our association. On the left, you can see waterworks, and to the right is sewerage. Water pollution in Vietnam is growing exponentially worse as a result of industrialization and population growth. This makes it difficult to treat water, and residents' demands for safe water have also risen significantly. These are some of the problems that Haiphong is facing. We are carrying out various demonstration projects using JICA's Partnership Program Scheme and ODA Grant Aid to develop proposals for solutions to overcome these problems. In sewerage as well, Haiphong is facing the same problems. But today, COBA member companies have started to acquire contracts for operation, maintenance, and management in the sewerage field. I have divided up COBA's vision for the future into two separate themes. The first is technology and human resources, and the other is financial aspects. A variety of problems can be found in our partner countries with the evolution of the water business, particularly in Asia. To solve these problems, we organize matching seminars adopting a unified approach to sales by the public and private sectors, take part in exhibitions, and introduce products from COBA's member companies. In addition, in terms of introducing and commercializing advanced technologies, we are working on developing commercial-based businesses from ODA projects, utilizing the technologies of companies originating in Kitikishu. Through these efforts, we are aiming to achieve the goals of the SDGs through the water business. Next, I would like to look at the financial side of our vision for the future. We have added the experience and trust of the public sector to the technology and capital of the private sector. One immediate problem is the lack of long-term financial planning, such as the fact that sufficient revenue cannot yet be secured from the collection of fees. Further developments must be made to solve these issues. 
Today, ODA is primarily comprised of grant aid projects, but in the future, it will become necessary to shift to the creation of for-profit businesses. This will require sophisticated, efficient, and economically sound proposals. We are looking to build up trusting relationships based on our long history of international cooperation and track record in ODA projects. As we shift from ODA to the local private sector to establish long-term business opportunities with roots in partner countries. We will also continue to provide support for the formation of proposals for projects to attract the financial clout and investment from the private sector. Some examples include our track record of collaborating with other companies to sell products based on our achievements in ODA business models, as well as the joint acquisition of a water service license with a local company to operate a private waterworks. Thank you, Mr. Arita. Next, we have Mr. Mitsukane Mori, General Manager at Nippon Steel Engineering, Japan, who will be speaking to us about waste treatment. Hello, my name is Mitsukane Mori, and I am from Nippon Steel Engineering. Our company has a technical center established in Kirikyushu City. In 2015, we signed a comprehensive agreement to collaborate with the Kirikyushu City local government and have been working together to solve environmental and energy issues overseas. In today's presentation, I would like to discuss the importance and effectiveness of building municipal solid waste management systems for the development of sustainable cities, with a focus on waste-to-energy technology. This graph shows projections by the United Nations Environment Program on the amount of municipal waste generated. According to this graph, the amount of municipal solid waste generated is expected to increase sharply between 2010 and 2030, mainly in the Asia-Pacific and Latin American regions, due to population growth and economic development. In addition to an increase in the amount of municipal solid waste generated, the ever-increasing urban development in these regions worsen waste management issues. Specifically, final disposal sites for landfilling and disposing of municipal waste are under considerable strain, and the living environment is deteriorating because of odors and sanitation issues. There have also been reports of tragic accidents at final disposal sites which have exceeded capacity, such as the collapse of landfills, which have led to countless deaths of nearby residents. In order to prevent this situation, it is important to build a comprehensive waste management system suited to the local conditions of each city, such as the construction of sanitary landfills, development of waste collection systems, promotion of the 3R policies, and the introduction of waste-to-energy systems. Waste-to-energy facilities are particularly effective in reducing the volume of waste, making them an effective technology for the sustainable development of cities. Nippon Steel Engineering has approximately 500 references worldwide of stoker-type waste-to-energy plants, which are able to stably process a wide range of municipal waste and achieve a high electricity generation efficiency of up to 30%. Municipal solid waste is fed into hoppers by a crane, as you can see at the bottom left-hand side of this slide, where it is completely combusted in incinerators. Heat from the incineration process is used to produce steam in boilers, which is fed into a turbine generator, as you can see here on the right, and recovered as electricity. NOx, SOx, dioxins, and other harmful substances are removed in the flue gas treatment facility, allowing the incineration flue gas to be released from the chimney as clean gas that complies with local and or national emission standards. This figure shows an example of a waste management scheme that incorporates a waste-to-energy facility with a gasification and melting system, which we call a direct melting system. With a total of 1,300 tons of household and commercial waste generated per day, 340 tons of recyclable waste is recycled daily through segregation at source and mechanical separation. The remaining 960 tons of waste per day is treated at the waste-to-energy facility which produces 96 tons of residue daily. The development of this type of waste management scheme can drastically reduce the amount of waste to be landfilled from 1,300 tons to 96 tons per day, which can extend the lifespans of final disposal sites. 
The 780 megawatts of electricity recovered from the waste to energy process per day can be used to power 40,000 households. The application of a feed-in tariff system to electricity sales of electricity generated in waste to energy projects can result in establishing an efficient and sustainable municipal solid waste management scheme powered by the private sector. However, we must not forget that the core principle of waste to energy utilization to manage municipal waste should be that it is a safe, secure, and reliable treatment method because waste is generated every day and if not treated in a timely manner, can limit the potential of development for healthy cities. I have added an overview of Nippon Steel Engineering in the last slide. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Mori. Next, we have Mr. Tomoaki Ito, CEO and Representative Director of One World Corporation Japan, who will speak about marine plastic litter. In cities that are slower to modernize and those where incineration is prohibited, waste is landfilled or dumped. Discarded waste flows from rivers out into the sea, polluting the oceans along with materials that are directly dumped into these waters. Some of this waste washes up on the shores of other countries or drifts to islands, and current eddies are causing trash islands to form on a global level. In recent years, as humanity has turned towards the use of microplastics, our actions are said to have a greater negative impact on the living creatures of our planet. We must put an end to dumping waste into the natural environment. I think we need to take action on a global level from both of these perspectives to avoid passing on a negative legacy to our children. We need to take the initiative to act, especially in urban areas where a large amount of waste is emitted. I hope that we can make use of our company's know-how to solve social issues on a global level. To address the issue of CO2 and dioxin emissions from the incineration of waste, we have developed a system that does not burn waste, but instead treats waste through a thermal reaction using superheated steam, which does not generate dioxins or CO2. Installing this system in cities that are landfilling or dumping waste can stop pollution on a global scale, little by little, and can contribute to industries such as in the manufacturing of machinery, employment, and operation of equipment in areas that are modernizing at a slower pace. This system can also produce energy from waste and generate advantages from waste treatment. This may have been true for a few segments of the waste management process in the past, but I think that this is the first system of its kind to bring about returns from the entire waste management process. We are also aiming at zero emissions to clean up the environment by closing the loop instead of releasing waste outside. The development of an energy circulating society on a global scale can solve waste problems around the world and create a circulating society to restore our beautiful planet. This may include the development of a global level body to manage carbon credits through a private initiative. The management of credits could be made transparent and the overall actions of the organization could be managed by using blockchains. A virtual currency could be issued that would become the global currency for the purchase of credits, which could speed up the circulation of money. For starters, fossil fuel refineries and companies using oil would be invited to purchase credits. Then supporters of the system, corporations, individuals, institutional investors, and green funds would be invited to purchase virtual currency through funding and investments to cover the operational costs of the governing body. This governing body would then use these funds in order to purchase packer trucks and equipment and vehicles needed to collect waste. These could be leased out to public organizations and other contractors who collect waste needed for recycled oil to cover leasing fees. Processing plants could also be leased out to energy conversion processors that produce recycled oil or perform carbonization and gasification to produce energy to recover leasing fees. In this way, the system would provide a source of income for the governing body, which in turn would help build new industries and contribute to improving the environment and creating employment opportunities. With this system, 5% of the world's crude oil demand could be met with the use of recycled oil, which would clean up the environment of our planet. 
We call this the Kide Project, a plan to involve the entire global community in creating a more beautiful Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ito. Next, we have Mr. Toshiko Yanagi, Managing Director at NCT Malaysia, who will speak about air pollution measures. I am Toshihiko Yanagi from NCT Malaysia. Thank you for having me here today. Some 4 billion people across the Asia-Pacific region today are exposed to levels of air pollution that pose serious risks to human health. Air pollution is divided up into several categories. In the Southeast Asian nation of Malaysia where I live, the category that is literally the most visible type of damage from air pollution is haze. Haze can occur during the dry season between April and October. As you can see in the photo on the slide, visibility is reduced on days when the air pollution index is high and a distinctive burnt odor blankets the city. In the worst case scenario, it can be difficult to breathe even indoors and disrupts daily life. Air pollution in Southeast Asia can be divided into three main categories. Emissions from cars and motorcycles, mainly in urban areas, pollution from industrial activities, and haze. As many of you know, haze is a type of pollution caused by particulate matter from smoke and exhaust gas generated by slash and burn agriculture, open burning for the purpose of land development, and forest fires. Haze contains a variety of toxins, NOx, SOx, carbon monoxide, ozone, PM10, PM2.5, and others. Although a magic wand can erase haze instantaneously, I would like to show you a few examples of our products that may be able to help with this problem. First up is our Selective Catalytic Reduction Technology, which is commonly referred to as an SCR system. This system has been used for many years in Japan to remove NOx. This method uses ammonia water to break down NOx into nitrogen and water, which is released into the air. We produce and sell ammonia water from the gas generated during the production of coke, which is the raw material for iron. Next are our hydrogen sulfide adsorption filters. These filters are impregnated with special minerals that adsorb and chemically bond with corrosive gases. They are highly functional filters capable of simultaneously adsorbing acidic gases such as hydrogen sulfide and methylmercaptan as well as basic gases such as ammonia and amine. Next, we have our bag filters. These filters are used for dust collectors that collect fine dust generated from iron manufacturing, iron and steel, and crushed stones, for example. We offer a wide range of products, from general purpose to high-performance bag filters to meet the needs of our customers. These products may not bring about a drastic improvement to haze itself, but we believe if their use expands at the grassroots level, they will become a meaningful way to counter air pollution. Our vision for the future is to be engaged in the development of a sustainable society together with all stakeholders involved with our company. Although the issue of air pollution is a byproduct of economic activity, in all practicality, we cannot stop it. That said, people can change. For example, we are in a time that has become known as the new normal because of the impact of COVID-19 this year. I think that this has seen many people change the way they work and think. In the same way, by providing our customers with business plans and ways to use goods and know-how, that differ from traditional ways of thinking, we can contribute to the development of our customers and society and help improve environmental issues. As a trading company, we hope to be able to implement such activities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yanagi. Thank you all for your presentations. I'd like to direct my first question to Mr. Mori. Waste is an extraordinarily critical urban issue in Asian cities where it continues to rise. It seems that waste to energy is both a technology and business capable of meeting the needs of Asian cities. What issues do you think need to be addressed to promote the deployment of this technology to Asia? There are two major issues to address when promoting the use of waste to energy technologies in Asian countries. 
One is the lack of relevant systems, laws, and regulations, and the other is the lack of knowledge and experience of local governments and other stakeholders. A feed-in tariff system for electricity sales is vital in establishing a successful waste-to-energy business powered by the private sector. However, there are cases where a feed-in tariff system is not applied or waste-to-energy is not covered in such systems. In addition, local governments that are in a position to arrange contracts for waste-to-energy projects may not necessarily have the experience or know-how to tender and award bids or properly evaluate proposals. Japan has implemented various schemes for waste treatment, from publicly managed projects to PFI, so I think that sharing Japan's experience with different countries will help solve problems. Thank you. I would like to ask you one more question. What do you see as a breakthrough for the expansion of waste-to-energy projects in the Asian market? How do you think public-private partnerships with Kitakyushu City will contribute to these breakthroughs? I think it's important to establish a comprehensive treatment scheme that is suited to the amount and quality of waste and local conditions of the area. Kitakyushu City is one of the most experienced municipalities in Japan and has a large pool of capable officers with deep know-how and experience on how to develop grand designs for waste treatment in almost any given region. For this reason, Kitakyushu City can provide support to City A in Asia, for example, to formulate basic plans for waste treatment and conduct individual waste quality studies through city-to-city -city cooperation. Based on this, we would like to achieve breakthroughs by dividing up our roles, such as verifying the feasibility of a project from the perspective of treatment technology and business profitability. The Phnom Penh Miracle has helped Kitakyushu's overseas water business become a household name around the world. What type of cooperation do you hope to receive in the future from the companies and investors from Asian countries that are participating in today's session in order to promote overseas cooperation and projects in the water and sewage field? The lack of funding in each country is a bottleneck to the development of environmental infrastructure in Southeast Asian countries which means that the use of private investment will be vitally important in the future. However, many investors struggle to determine the nature of their business and the applicability of their investments due to a lack of information about the market and how appropriate their investment is to the overseas water business. Kirikyushu and Koba have long-standing networks experiences, and shared information with Southeast Asian cities through their involvement in international environmental cooperation, which may prove to be useful to such investors. I believe it is important to build networks with investors in Japan and other Asian countries through this Harasis meeting as a new form of public-private partnership. Thank you. My next question is directed to Mr. Yanagi. Cities with the highest level of air pollution are concentrated in Asia. What are your views on investment opportunities for air pollution control in Asia? In the past, many parts of Japan experienced enormous amounts of pollution. We cannot place blame at the shores of other countries for their economic activities because they are simply following the same path that developed countries once took. Developed countries are complicit in and contribute to mass production and consumption, meaning that it can be said that these countries are the cause of air pollution. In particular, I believe that Japan, as a country that has suffered from air pollution and other environmental hardships in the past, and as a country that has overcome these hardships, should make some sort of contribution to cities and countries with high levels of air pollution as part of its social responsibility. As far as Southeast Asia is concerned, from what I have seen and heard on the ground, laws are being developed at the national and local levels, and companies are implementing their own original measures. There have also been cases where foreign companies are providing support or investing. However, the sporadic occurrence of such instances in different parts of the country will not have a cohesive effect on a regional scale. In order to change the current point-to-point -point measures so that it connects lines and surfaces, we must be aware of the need to promote discussions in a way that encourages collaboration between the public and private sectors 
including both business-to-business -business and government-to-government -government measures, and to stimulate ESG investment and technical support. I have one additional question. Today, the transition to a circular economy is picking up speed, especially in Europe. Climate change and the reduction of plastic waste are two main concerns for ESG investment. We would like to hear about how your company's initiatives on plastic can contribute to the creation of a circular economy. Since we are traditionally a trading company, we do not have our own manufacturing facility. We have been focusing on the sale of recycled and off-grade resins and have already established sales channels, so we started to manufacture resin products using recycled resin a few years ago. The key to manufacturing products with recycled resin is how closely they are manufactured to the specifications of standard products. So, we decided to manufacture our own recycled resin based on our knowledge of the supply chain. Simply put, we started to think that we should be 100% responsible for recycling plastic, so we invested in and installed equipment in our group companies, purchased technology from our group companies, and our manufacturing products not only in Japan, but in Hong Kong and China as well. Our customers now sell products made using our materials around the world. We have turned our focus to mixed products manufactured from industrial waste rather than from resin recycled from home appliance recycling centers. We use our technology to break them down into smaller pieces through reprocessing, which we then refine into recycled products that are no different than standard grades. I'm not sure if I can say that we are contributing to the realization of the global circular economy, but I am proud to say that we are playing a part in that. Thank you. I would like to direct my next question to Mr. Ito. As interest grows around the world on measures to address marine plastic litter, your company's technologies are attracting attention for their ability to process a wide variety of waste materials, including marine plastic. Please give us some insight into your vision of how your company's technologies and business models can help identify solutions to the world's marine plastic problem. In response to waste problems faced by two cities in Thailand, One World has partnered with a Thai company called PTT Public Corporation to promote the use of urban rigs that do not generate carbon dioxide and dioxins. We are working with local governments to revise the environment regulations and make it legal to dispose of waste without burning it. Specifically, we plan to provide the technology to produce the urban rigs locally firstly in Bangkok and Pattaya, and will employ local hires and contribute to the industries in the country. The main difference between waste incineration methods and the urban rig is that the urban rig treats waste through a thermal reaction of superheated steam and produces energy through operations instead of disposing of it like incinerated ash. This process enables the production of recycled oil and charcoal from waste and recycling of metallic glass and other materials. It is also possible to incorporate a system that uses recycled oil to generate electricity and a system that converts seawater and sewage into fresh water using the heat source of the urban rig. One World has partnered with PTT Public Corporation and Soljits Thailand and is currently considering building a local production base to solve problems with municipal solid waste treatment. We are planning to conduct field surveys on the waste situation in Thailand. We are also planning to develop plans in relation to COVID-19 and for processes to treat municipal waste without combustion. We are in talks with PTT Public Corporation, the Petroleum Authority of Thailand, to get their cooperation as customers in purchasing the recycled oil produced through the operation of the urban rig. We are aiming to develop a sustainable system from the treatment of waste. Your company has already expanded into Southeast Asia, and you have continued your efforts to become a destination for private sector investment. Please tell us how public-private partnerships have helped with this process. Right now, we are working with Kirikishu City, IGES, and UNEP to develop an AEPW support project for waste treatment issues on Samet Island in Rayong Province in Thailand, where we are trying to develop a zero-plastic island model. This project is still in the review stage and is an important initiative between Kitikishu City and One World. 
The review process is nearly completed, and we are currently waiting on the results. So we need to move forward with meetings to discuss actions in more detail. One World is moving ahead with the next stage of development to ensure the success of this project in creating an island model that is self-sufficient by providing solutions to the problems of waste, lack of electricity, and water. Thank you. I'd like to direct my next question to Ms. Oda. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society. What other environmental improvements do you think are necessary to continue to contribute to resolving environmental issues in Asia through public-private partnerships? Demand for green growth is increasing in Asian countries as they look to achieve economic development that is in balance with the environment. I would like to mention two ways that we can improve the environment. The first is in terms of securing costs. It is true that many cities hesitate to introduce environmental technologies because of the high costs they incur. For this reason, I think we need global companies and governments to contribute funds and for a system to be designed to encourage this, such as by requiring companies that use plastic containers to fund a certain percentage. The second solution is to strengthen intercity cooperation. Over the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society's 10 years of activities, I have strongly felt that urban environmental problems cannot be solved only with the introduction of technology, but that a comprehensive effort to raise public awareness, develop human resources, and design systems is needed. For this reason, I believe that intercity cooperation will take on even more importance. Thank you. I would like to ask you one more question. What are your expectations of the companies and investors listening in on this session in light of the fact that the Horasis Asia meeting will be held in Kirikishu in 2021? Kirikishu has made use of its past experience in overcoming pollution to take up environmental problems in Asia together with other cities in the region. Kirikishu is one of only a handful of cities in Japan with this kind of experience and we intend to continue to provide solutions based on the environmental needs of cities in Asia. I would like to invite all the cities and companies that are here today and that are struggling to deal with environmental problems to get in touch with Kitakishu. I would also like to invite companies and investors to invest and inject capital to support these activities as partners. Thank you all for engaging in the lively discussion today and for your invigorating messages. Lastly, I would like to briefly summarize today's discussion in three points. First, the city of Kitakishu has turned its past negative experience with pollution into an asset and is engaged in solving environmental problems in the Asian region through public-private partnerships. This has proven to be a reason why the city is widely acknowledged both in Japan and overseas to be an environmentally advanced city and a model SDGs city. The Asian Center for Low Carbon Society and the Kitakishu Overseas Water Business Association are platforms at the very heart of these initiatives. In today's session, we were able to learn a bit about their collaborative efforts to support Asian cities in areas that are difficult for companies to handle alone, such as in the development of human resources, creation of systems, and acquisition of budgets. Today, three companies also joined us to introduce specific examples of how they are deploying environmental technologies overseas. These companies are working to commercialize with an extensive menu of environmental technologies around city-to-city -city collaboration. They offered a clear message that the utilization of private sector capital is key and that companies and investors should be involved as partners. As global trends become part of the mainstream, such as the SDGs, low carbon development, and the circular economy. The timing is right for full-scale markets to be created to deploy environmental technology, raising expectations for the concrete development of commercial-based businesses to advance into the Asian market. We would like to invite you all to meet us in Kitakishu in 2021 and experience the food, culture, and hospitality of our city as well as see and hear firsthand about information on packaged solutions, including the know-how, experiences, and technologies of Kitakyushu's local government, organizations, and companies. If you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact the Asian Center for Low Carbon Society.
With that, I would like to conclude today's Kita Kyushu session. I would like to thank the panelists for their time today, and to thank you all for attending today's session. We are eagerly looking forward to seeing you in Kita Kyushu in 2021.